What's up, everybody? We're here. We're at it. Um, sorry for another delay. Had a call right before I jumped on. That was actually from somebody whose family member watches me on YouTube from across the state. Had a car accident. Wanted to talk about it. So we just got through that. Um, and this is this is a fun, uplifting video, right? Yes, I was running late. I, apo I apologize. Um, so... Anytime I, I have these videos in the middle of the day, it's difficult to get exact times because stuff pops up. It's just the life of, of being a lawyer. Not everything happens exactly when you need it to. Um, but regardless, four minutes late is pretty good for a lawyer. Um, so we're going to watch an interview of Judge Doro. I was sent a couple different versions of interviews, and it was hard to pick which one. I didn't watch every single one of them. So I picked one of the longer ones that will probably have as much information as we can get from her. If it's missing any information, um, I we, we can talk through what information it's missing. I did get some background information from another interview that I just absolutely loved um, about how her family is Greek and how they, uh, her her grandmother who was one of the most influential people in her life was Greek and was a strong Greek woman um, and was a single mom to her mother and how they really pushed. There's a lot of lawyers in their family uh, and stuff like that was a really, really cool uh, interview as well. So if you see interviews with her, go ahead and check them out. But this is one of the long ones. I think it's like 16 minutes. This is the most common one that was sent to me and it actually did. You guys know, I like to add um, value to the content that we discussed together and that we watched together. And this one actually answered a lot of questions that we had throughout the trial. Like what was her schedule like? Um, was she able to talk to other judges? Was she able to get guidance and get help? How did she deal with this? How did she deal with that? How did she think about this? And what is her next move? Does she have her eyes on another position apparently, or um, supposedly, and we will talk through that, talk through what we can learn from this interview and other interviews about her potential decision for what is next for Judge Doro. She's Greek. I shouldn't be surprised at all about that. She is very, very quickly becoming the favorite lawyer of this channel of all the trials that we've watched. I don't know if we can call her that just yet, but she was amazing throughout the trial. You all are amazing for joining me here. Um, hit that like button if you haven't already. If you guys are not a subscriber to the channel, please hit that subscribe button because we rock together as a channel and a chat talking about these cases. And even when they're over, sometimes they linger a little bit and we get some other information from outside sources that helps us better understand what happened in the trial. And we can use this when we watch other trials or when I try cases or if you are ever a juror or have a case of your own, you can know what a judge thinks, what they do, what their schedule's like. So the process is not as daunting to you, hopefully, if you ever find yourself in this situation. So let me get my headphones here. And as soon as you hit that like button, we'll start watching. Great to see you. Thanks for making it. All right, let me know how the audio is when we do this. Now, the questioner, the interviewer's volume is not as good as the judge's, so but we, we'll be able to hear the judge better, so don't freak out if you can't hear the, ask, the question as well. Uh, I know there's limits to what we can talk about here, right? So we'll do our best to try to navigate through this, but this was such an important trial and moment for this jury. Um, what can you tell us about the experience for you and how you manage through this. So he said, I know there are certain things we can't talk about because we know there's going to be an appeal. There's always an appeal in situations like this. So there are certain things she can't talk about still because of that. But he wants to know what the experience was like for her because this was such an important case. So in case you can't hear the questions, I'll try to repeat, repeat some of them. Well, I can't talk about the specifics of the case. I have some ethical considerations to be mindful of. What I can say is I was really honored that this case was assigned to me and given really the privilege of navigating through it um, from the beginning, not really knowing where it would all go. Um, certainly the amount of time that I spent on the case was longer than any 
case I had personally been involved with, whether as an attorney or as a judge to set aside an entire month of my calendar. Um, it's so funny to think that so many people have never tried a case that lasts an entire month. Uh, my first trial as a lawyer lasted over a month and I didn't realize how huge and daunting that actually was. And it made a lot of the other trials seem easier when that's what you start with a federal trial like that. Um, cause those are the kinds of cases my dad has. My dad's had ton of tons of trials that have lasted months and months. Um, so it's just really interesting when she says, even with her, you know, uh, big time career as a prosecutor, as a judge, never had a trial that lasted a month. But, um, it, a lot of long days, um, a lot of, uh, support from my colleagues was truly, truly amazing. And um, we often say, you know, when you have a case like that, you don't go through it alone. And my colleagues were tremendous in their support and helping me out in a variety of different ways. So that's her first mention of her colleagues, which can mean a lot of different things. It can mean lawyers she used to work with at the state attorney's office. It can mean other judges. Um, it can mean things like that. And she mentions that they were a huge support and help to her along the way. She references it even more later that she absolutely asked for advice from other people who gave her good counsel and helped her wade these waters of a very difficult trial. Talk about that because you're the chief judge in Waukesha County, but there's a team. You have a team and there was a lot of people involved. Uh, how did the team do? How did you manage the team? Sure. So could not do something like this, really any trial, without the team with the clerk of courts, our district court administrator, my in-court and out-of-court team, so my deputy clerk and legal clerk, um, my court reporter, of course, and so many logistics. And um, there's a lot of planning, a lot of team building, of course, needed the sheriff's department involved because they're in charge of courtroom security. Um, and then, of course, the jail for any time there's an in-custody uh, defendant, they have to be involved as well. So a lot of communication. Um, I really take my hats off to our clerk of court, Monica Paz, and our district court administrator, Mike Nyman, for really taking the- It's a shout to the team, you know? It's not just the star player, it's the team. Um, and good job by her. And yeah, it really is a lot of moving parts, a lot of logistics in a trial like this, because the jail has to be way more involved when the defendant's in custody than when the defendant's just showing up there every day, like in some of the trials that we've seen, show up with the lawyers um, and, and things like that. So a good shout to her by the whole court staff. And that was a good rundown just for lay people to see all the people that are involved in running a trial day to day. In addition to this, there are other judges covering her daily calendar that she has because she still has cases. She still has hearings. She still has pretrials and other judges have to carry, uh, handle that for her. The brunt of all of that and keeping things organized so that I could focus on the task at hand. So how did you stay focused? You knew this was a big community event, but it was also attracting national attention. Also had some political narratives attached to it as well. Um, so how did you manage the, all the attention and the distractions. How did you manage all the attention and the distractions? There was a you know nationwide attention on it, political. There were some political aspects of it. That was the question here. Honestly, I just did my job every single day like I would for any case. And that's being prepared uh, for the start of jury selection, for example. I take a large role in that, which is different than some judges and how I conduct uh, jury selection for all of my cases. Um, and I'll even go back uh, before my day even starts. I am a strong woman of faith. And without that, um, I think it would be hard pressed to get through something with such stress and pressure and um, the weight of everything. And that's day in and day out for any judge. So I start my day every day reading my Bible and in prayer to kind of put myself in the right attitude and mindset. I truly, truly believe that what I do is not a career, it's a calling and um, that I serve the people of the state of Wisconsin and the citizens of Waukesha County. And that's, I mean, what a great answer that is, right? I mean, to deal with what she had to deal with, to deal with Daryl Brooks, a lot of us were asking, how is this possible? How could she possibly, you know, deal with this? Well, there's your answer right there. Starting your day in, in the Bible and prayer and meditation to get yourself ready for this calling of a job that can be very difficult in cases like this. Um, what an amazing answer and an example to all of us, frankly, um, on the best way to start your day. What is what is amazing about this as well is she talks about how she takes a big role in jury selection. That's one of the parts of the trial we did not watch. Some of you may have watched it. I didn't watch the jury selection. State court judges 
don't always take a big role. Sometimes they'll just let the lawyers handle it. But the fact that she always takes a larger role probably made it easier for her to handle a pro se defendant case like this because she was able to make sure that the questions and answers to protect his rights were done. Um, I also think that someone with her demeanor and her integrity, like we're talking about, and, and someone who's a strong woman of faith, and as we heard from a lot of the victims saying the same things, we even heard the defendant saying that. That was kind of a big theme of this trial in being fair and balanced. That, to me, is, is a major indicator of that, and we saw it through action. It's one thing to just hear the words. As again, like I said, there were a lot of people in this courtroom we heard this type of word from or this type of speech from. Man of faith, the Bible, what the Bible says. But actions speak so much louder than words, and her actions are right in line with the words that she's saying here on this interview. My focus, that's what keeps me going. That, and I'm that guardian of the rights for not just victims, but defendants. And I take that role really, really Serious. She represents the people of the state, right? And I always say this, and I'm so glad that she said it. So her background is she was a prosecutor. I don't think she was ever a criminal defense lawyer. She was a prosecutor. And so the fact that she says she doesn't only look out for the victims and the rights of the victims, but also the criminal defendants and the accused. This is the chief judge here in Waukesha saying that she looks out for the rights of the victims and the defendants and the accused. That is exactly what our legal system is supposed to look like. We saw her on the bench. She was even more patient than I could have ever imagined being myself. And I look up to her for that. That is what it's supposed to be like for lawyers and judges. We are supposed to look out for everybody's rights. We are all officers of the court. And she is giving us a great name and not just explaining how things should be, but we all saw when all the pressure was on exactly how she acted. And, mm. and that's how I went about each and every day and a lot of preparation. I have a wonderful law clerk. I mean, there are certain issues you can predict may come up. Um, and so we were prepared with all of those. And then if issues would come up, I of course would uh, have him work on things. And then I would take those in and run with it and make the decisions that I needed to make. So how did you provide that balance though? You knew the impact that this tragedy had in the community, but you also knew what your role how did you balance this? How did you balance the this tragedy that affected so many in our community, but also dealing with the rights of the defendant? That's the question here. You have to be as a judge. How did you find that balance? Following the law is a great thing to do, right? And I would do that in any case, not just this case, um, and really focus on what does the law say and how do I apply that to this particular case or any case that comes before me? So when you... Um... When you talked about all that time, this took, uh, this was the longest trial you ever participated in? Yes. Um, you probably anticipated that though, right? I did. I set that time aside back in uh, one of the first court appearances before me. But tell me what it's like to be Judge Doral. Everybody knows what you're doing in the courtroom, but you have to leave the courtroom to come home, uh, go places. Um, so what's a judge's schedule like in a trial like this, right? That's always interesting. It's good information for lawyers to know, for jurors to know, for if you're a victim in a case, a plaintiff in a case, a defendant in a case. It's interesting. You may want to know this. And this gives us a little look behind the curtain here of a real judge that goes through a high-profile, month-long trial. So how did you manage that? In essence, are you like a juror? You really can't talk to anybody, right? Well, I can talk to my colleagues, right? That is one thing that even the rules of ethics support. And so I'd rely a lot on my colleagues to decompress, to bounce ideas or uh, decisions that I would have to make um, and say, what do you think about this? And what do you think about that? Um, they were incredible. That's a really big revelation. While you're allowed to, a lot of judges don't. They don't ask for the opinions and advice and counsel of other people. She seems way too smart for that, right? I, I just talked to somebody today about, you know, potentially being a mentor in this area of law or helping us with this. You've always got to be willing to ask people for help, ask people for advice, know who to ask, know what advice to take and be um, stern in your decisions and be firm and strong in what you believe and what your decisions are, but asking for counsel and advice from different people. We talk about the chat and people, the different perspectives in the chat. It's really helpful to learn. 
And she did that in this case. We knew these decisions were difficult. We knew that she had things where she probably wasn't positive on how to handle it, how far to push, how uh, lenient to be, how patient to be, but she got that help. And Azam said, if somebody has already become a judge, can they also be an attorney in some cases? No, but you can go from being a judge to back to being an attorney, which happens sometimes. And as a judge, you still have attorney friends that she can talk to, which is my guess is she talked to attorney friends and other friends that were judges. Um, and she also references the ethics multiple times. And what's really interesting about that is there, every state has an ethics hotline that you can call. If you're not sure about something, you can say, Hey, what's the ethical way to handle this? Cause we don't know everything about everything. And if something smells bad, usually it is, but not always is. And maybe the ethics hotline can give you the right way to handle it. Or they can tell you don't do that. You can't do that. Or they can say, here's an ethics opinion. You can absolutely do that. So no lawyer really has an excuse for acting in an unethical manner. And we call the ethics hotline literally all the time because things pop up. Can we pay this referral fee? Can we handle this here? Can we do this there? What if our client says this? What if the judge says that? And the ethics hotline is all confidential and privileged conversations between lawyers and the ethics hotline because we want to promote ethical lawyering and promote ethical judicial actions. And she asks and references the ethics rules multiple times, which I love to hear. You love to hear lawyers that are asking what the ethical thing is to do in situations. Uh, to do that with. And then of course, just coming home and really unwinding. Um, you know, I think we all have our favorite TV shows that we like to watch. And I still was mom. I have uh, three children, uh, two of which are uh, really out of the house, either in school or working. And then my younger one is 12 and she's a very competitive athlete. So there were nights I was driving to Illinois with her because that's where she trained. And um, you know, but that was kind of a nice time for me to share with her as well. And there were other times when I rely on her teammates. We have some teammates from up here as well to help out with the rides. And of course, my husband was amazing and uh, support. I, I joke around that for at least the first two weeks, I needed protein in the middle of the week. And I said, we have a great restaurant down the street. And I got a steak, brought it home and it kind of fed me for a couple of days and just tried to relax each night, get a good night's sleep, and then start each day as I would any other day just to keep focused. Did friends, you know, want to like say something to you? Did you try to like avoid the news because you just didn't want to see what was happening? Well, I wouldn't say I avoided the news. I wanted to kind of see what was out there. Um, also another revelation, and we know this from other cases that other judges um, are also watching the news and understanding what's happening in their case. And sometimes it can give you an idea. And so that's very interesting to me that she followed along. I wonder if she watched any YouTube videos. I wonder if she um, looked at anything on social media. It would be very interesting to see how people thought she was doing. And sometimes that can give you confidence if, I mean, think about the Depp case and some of these other cases. The world was on her side. The world was kind of against Daryl Brooks. And I think she could see that the way she was handling the case, that it can be a little bit of confirmation um, that her patience is paying off. It's working. Daryl Brooks isn't tricking anybody. This case is still going the way that it should. Robo Steve, have you seen that Daryl Brooks is seeking to get paid for interviews? I heard that. I heard some really creepy stuff about how he said somebody else was in the room, but in fact, he was the only one in the room when he said he wanted to get paid for these interviews, which is not surprising at all. Lisa, what if a judge handling her cases rules in a way different than what Judge Dor Doro would have ruled? Oh, so it's interesting. Usually when a covering judge, which I think is what you're talking about, is handling these things, they try not to make huge decisions. They always defer to whoever's case it actually is as the judge. They know how a judge deals with it. Most of the time, it is simple rulings, keeping cases moving, discovery disputes, like she said, applying the law, applying the facts, handling it that way. And most judges are on the same page. It's unusual for two judges to be on totally different pages. Uh, Radio Chaos, will you cover the Visine killer case? Judge Doro will preside over it in February. It will be shown live like the Brooks case. Here is how we will know Radio Chaos if we're covering that case. Let me know. If you guys want to see it, just like you want to see this interview, hit me up. Uh, let me make this a little bigger. At Tragos Law on Instagram and Twitter. That's where a lot of you sent me this interview. I watched a couple different interviews. I see some people posting some different interviews in the chat. Um, there's a bunch of them out there. We can watch more together on another date potentially. Um, but if we want to talk about the Visine killer, uh, everybody let me know in the comments, in the live chat, and on other social media channels. Uh, out of curiosity more than anything, 
um, but really just focused on regrouping each night and uh, getting rest and, you know, uh, making sure that I was ready to go for the next day. Were you surprised by the, all the letters that came in for you? Absolutely. Um, I should tell you, I haven't even read them. So they started coming in and um, I can't. She's talking about fan mail now. And Billy, most of the time, the advisors are the ones that pull more of the strings than the king or the president. It's an interesting comment consider ex parte communication. And so they started coming in and at first you're like, oh, one or two, right? I put them aside and then things really started coming in. And so um, after I consulted with um, our ethics folks in Madison, I decided that everything would go to the clerk of courts. She would scan everything in. So whether letters, cards, or if like flowers or edibles came, we'd keep a record of that. I did receive some emails um, directly. People, it's not hard to figure out uh, uh, court officials email. They're out there on the internet. And it's so public. Um, I just would forward everything printed off. And honestly, I really haven't had a chance to look through them. I mean, it was overwhelming. Um, and, uh, but something that you hope to go back and look at them and respond to them. I won't respond to them because yeah. I still have a way too case many. And, uh, but now that sentencing is over, um, and uh, at some point I'll make a decision when it's appropriate to review them. And I'd certainly like to do that. Um, from what I understand, at least from some of the news reports, I mean, I think the overwhelmingly were positive, a couple of criticisms, but that goes with the territory, so. So were you surprised at all the attention on you? I mean, I think even someone dressed up as you for Halloween. That um, was amazing because as I understand it, people were inspired as, um, as a woman. And then young girls were inspired. I'd, I've had people come up to me and people that I know say, my daughter's rethinking what she wants to do for a career because of what she saw you do and how you handled yourself. It reminds me, literally, of Miss Vasquez and the Johnny Depp case, right? I mean, that's really cool that we have the, and, and she mentioned it in another interview that 50% of lawyers are female but a lot less than 50% are on the bench. So it's really cool that she could be a role model for a lot of female lawyers who maybe want to be on the bench one day or maybe don't, whatever it may be, or lawyers that want to be professional. She also talks about being a working mom that she's going to get into, but I thought it was really awesome in her other interview that she said, being a working mom is amazing. We don't have to sacrifice. I think we do it all. Uh, we do make sacrifices for our kids. We don't have to sacrifice being a mom, something like that. She said it more beautifully than I. But then she also said, my mom was a stay-at-home mom, which I also thought was amazing. And she was able to pour so much time and energy into us. And then my uh, grandma was a single mom who had to work multiple jobs. And she just complimented and made a great point that any way you do it, you can do it right. You can do it the right way. It can be amazing. You can be a role model. You can be an example to people. You can be a mentor to people um, that you know that are younger than you or even older than you in different situations than you. And I loved it because she really doesn't just say it's her way or the highway, um, but she does say, do it the best way, do it the right way, do it with ethics. Um, and I loved that in kind of every way that she explains everything. So I just wanted to point that out because she is going to get into the working mom thing, which is amazing. She does a great job in other interviews. She talks about it, so she doesn't leave anybody out. So that was really um, heartwarming, overwhelming um, that people would choose to I think do it as a way to honor, um, not as a joke or a ridicule. Um, I even went to my friend's Halloween party and unbeknownst to me, she was dressed up as me. I walk in her door and she is dressed up as me. I mean, I had tears in my eyes. I'm like, that was really overwhelming. How does that make you feel as a mother and as a judge that young girls are looking at you and saying, maybe that's what I can do? One of my crowning achievements is being a working mom. I might get a little emotional when I talk about that because not everyone is told, right? That they can have it all. It's a lot of work. There's a lot of sacrifice, but to teach my children, you know, whether my sons or my daughters, that you can work hard, you can be a public servant, you can have a career and still have your family and encourage them. And, um, hopefully inspire them. That to me was so overwhelming and um, it just amazes me that people look to me that way for doing 
what I love to do when that's my job. Um, how did your children react to, hey, that's our mom? You know, they were uh, constantly getting text messages or probably Snapchats and other types of messages from their friends on social media, you know, and sending me videos to watch and things like that. And they were pretty excited. They thought it was really neat. Were there role models for you? I mean, we had talked earlier, but your career. And what's interesting is when we hear people talk about these cases, whether it's lawyers, whether it's judges, whether, whether it's the parties, when it comes to social media, you can't get away from it. She has two older kids and a 12 year old, I believe. So three kids, you better believe they have social media. You better believe they watch YouTube and TikTok and Instagram and all that stuff. And it's really interesting how, um, this stuff circulates and how these people that are the major players in national news type cases, they are hearing and seeing what all of us are doing and talking about. Um, so I think we need to be mindful of that and, I don't know if I want to call that power or whatever, but any influence we could have, we want it to be positive, right? We don't want to rip people down or make them miserable. We want to build them up, but we want to be fair. We want to look at it objectively. Um, we want to give encouragement to do the right thing, right? And handle it the right way and not condemn somebody to go, you know, bury themselves in a hole if we feel like we disagree with them because that does nothing to help, especially people in powerful positions that can actually have a, a, um, a position or a platform to really make a difference. We'd rather encourage the good behavior or what should be done rather than just condemn, condemn, condemn. And I think this is just another example of her kids were seeing what was being shared on social media. So, you know, they were telling their mom about it. Um, so I just think that that's, that's an important thing to remember. So I had to go into law after thinking about journalism. Yes. Um, but were there role models for you? I go back to law school um, and had some professors that really, um, made an impact on me. Uh, one professor, uh, I was able to work as his research assistant and he had been the attorney general of Guam. He had been the prosecutor on a case, Illinois versus Gates. And so we had kind of a bird's eye view in, and it was a search warrant case. So had a bird's eye view into uh, that and just really fell in love with criminal law, did an internship while I was in law school uh, for a, a prosecutor's office in Virginia Beach. There was one woman there who, um, you know, was fun to watch her. Um, I had some classmates who were a little bit older as well, um, who law was a second career to them. And um, just as things unfolded, I really fell in love with criminal law. I wanted to come back home and be a prosecutor. And of course, kind of in the back of my mind, always thinking about the role of a judge and what that means. And so... We talked about other cases, other judges. I told you tons of them are prosecutors. Tons of them do nothing else but prosecute cases before they become judges. But you still see how she was overly kind, generous, patient to the criminal defendant, aware of his rights, protecting his rights. So you can do it. You can be unbiased. You can not show any bias from the bench, even if all you were before being a judge was a prosecutor. That's okay. And a lot of judges are like that. And she is one of them. You probably would have never guessed that as a lay person, right? It's interesting. And uh, I think in Wisconsin, we have two incredible, actually three, probably more, but two to three that really, really have made a difference to me. And that's Justice Rogensack, Justice uh, uh, Ziegler, who's our chief justice, and uh, Judge Diane Seitz, who's now with the Seventh Circuit. I mean, all strong women all women who have raised families while doing their jobs and doing them well. Awesome. And now's where we start to hear some of the shouts, uh, shout outs to other justices, to female justices, to appellate court justices. And now we kind of get a little peek into why there are all you guys are referencing five other interviews that she's done after this case. It seems to me like she's got an eye on the state Supreme Court and potentially that could be her next move. So we'll see. But I definitely think that's part of all these interviews. And a lot of you were asking that question after the trial. What's next? Will she be a Supreme Court justice one day? Well, it seems like the answer may be yes. So I've had some great role models here in Wisconsin. Well, you talked about some high profile role models as well. And some people are wondering, what's next for Judge Doral? Are you interested in running for the Wisconsin Supreme Court? Are you interested in running for the Wisconsin Supreme Court was the question. 
can tell you is I've been overwhelmed with the outpouring of support and encouragement uh, to consider a run for the Supreme Court. Um, I like to consider all my options, right? I want to weigh things and uh, certainly talk to my family and um, make a decision over the next couple of days, whether that's something that... Um, it's a lot to think about. Right. So it's kind of like a request for admissions. In Florida, if you don't deny them, they are deemed admitted. And to me, if you choose to do these interviews and you don't deny that you're going to run for the state Supreme Court, to me, it sounds like you're going to run for the state Supreme Court. And I hope she does. It'd be kind of fun to follow along with and have this connection and this much um, FaceTime with a state Supreme Court justice. So that would be cool. Uh, justice Polson in Florida was a professor at Florida State, which was kind of cool to get that FaceTime with a state Supreme Court justice as well. Um, he was tough, but. Right. It's whether it's something I'm interested in, whether it's something that I think is important to do. Of course, it's important. Um, and uh, again, just overwhelmed by the show of support uh, and, and encouragement to uh, consider doing that. Um, I love being a public servant, and that's where my heart is uh, in terms of career, uh, is that whatever I do, I want to continue serving the people uh, in Wisconsin and Waukesha County. A lot of times when I talk to people, you know, sometimes they're encouraged to run, and sometimes they, they look at it and they, they want to run, but uh, are you getting the encouragement to run? I am. Yeah, it's been overwhelming. It's been incredible, the people who have reached out to me and encouraged me to do this. Which is an indication that you have the support that you need to run. Azam, it is a court of appeals. Um, Emma, we have state Supreme Courts and then the United States Supreme Courts over the whole country, federal law, the United States Constitution. That's the U.S. Supreme Court. That's over everybody, over all the states. There are a separation of powers, right? There are some things that are state powers, something that are federal powers, but... The highest court is the United States Supreme Court, but there is a Supreme Court for each state that is the highest court in that state. Actually, not every state is like that. Um, there's some weird states where the Supreme Court's not actually the highest court. We don't need to go into all that. But yes, each state has their own highest court, which is different than you know the one that's in the news for making decisions that affect you know the nation or national news is the United States Supreme Court. So very different, yes. Um, but still a high, high honor. And she would be looking at the state Supreme Court. Uh, Randy Nakel, how do lawyers and judges who deal with the most horrific behavior keep from depression? I think we're literally hearing about that in this, um, video, right? She's very grounded in her faith with her family, with her friends, with her colleagues, with what she does and her life. And she's very confident and, and, um, she considers it a calling work is not her life. It's something that she does. It's her calling and what she, it's what she does to help people and represent people. Um, and I think that is the best way. And the timeline is pretty quick here. I mean, the, the, the primary is less than three months away. Nomination papers, I think, start later this week. So do you feel a sense of urgency about all of that? No doubt. We're going to find out soon enough. Um, when you look at what you set out to do. P.S. How cool of an answer is no doubt. It's like no doubt. What you wanted to do as a judge and how this whole trial how do you think in the end it, it turned out for you and the community when you look at what your job was for that time? Again, well, I don't want to comment on the specifics of the case because it is still, uh, there's a pending motion and he has uh, certainly appellate rights. What I would say is this, my role as a judge is part gatekeeper, part guardian. Um, I have a saying, I like to do things right the first time. And so with an eye- AKA, Ned, let's not open it up for an appeal by shutting down this pro se defendant because he's really trying to create issues. Toward making sure everything goes smoothly. Um, it's done according to the law and I apply the law to the facts. And so from my perspective, I would say I did that pretty well. Um, and beyond that, I, I don't you know, want to comment any further. Sure. Glad it's over. Uh, she didn't really answer. She kind of nodded her head, but he said, I'm glad it's over. She didn't say, yeah, me too. Cause you know, you don't want to really give that off. And she's really 
really smart and savvy. And I like the way that she smiled. She definitely agreed with him without saying that she agreed with him. Right. That's, that's a great, great job by her. I, Bruce, did you meet our reporter, Bruce, um, who was covering the trial? I'm not sure that I met him. Thanks, Patrick. He wants to know, uh, and, and, you know, what did you do during recess in the trial? Were you ever doing anything? <laughs> did you have any, like, moments of, during recess? Um, sometimes I'd make coffee. Other times I'd make tea. Um, sometimes, depending on the, the reason for the recess, I might be on the phone with colleagues. Um, See, they would take a recess with an issue. She'd be on the phone with colleagues, getting their advice. How should I handle this? Do you have the case law on it? Can you send me this case law? That's what was going on, which is really, really cool. And we talked about this a lot throughout the trial. This was our guess that yes, she was reaching out to colleagues, mentors, other judges. How do I handle this? What's the best way? Do you have case law on this issue? Well, well exactly. I have a pending caseload that before the trial was under 500. And of course, after the trial has grown a, a little bit beyond that. Um, and so I have other cases, right? I had mail coming in. So I'd have to get on my computer. I'd have to review my mail. I'd have to... Uh, make you know decisions on other things keep all of that going again i have a great staff they did a wonderful job and they know you know generally what i what i do when mail comes in and things of that nature but as they say the job had to continue it's it's so cliche but it's not my only case <laughs> true and uh, right now i have over 500 other cases insane that i have to yeah yeah wow. so yeah, wow. we have a big um and she's the chief judge in this county, but that is wild. 500 cases. Big docket here in Waukesha County. Um, and um, anyone will probably tell you if they appear in front of me regularly. I like to keep my cases going. I like to bring cases to resolution. Um, and there's no better way to do that than to keep cases on the trial calendar. That is amazing. That's the best kind of judge, frankly. And that's how this case got to trial so fast, which is wild. When we, we The case we talked about yesterday, the face-eating case, took six years. Right. So just think about that. There are ways to delay cases, but this judge keeps it rolling. Michelle Wood said, when I hear no doubt, um, was said, my mind went to the song. Don't speak. No, just what you're thinking. Um, now I can't get that song out of my head. I know Michelle. I think about that. I think about Gwen Stefani every time I hear the words, no doubt put together, uh, CJ lady. I think it's 10 years in Wisconsin, but I'm not positive. I'm not from Wisconsin, but yeah, most of them do have term limits. Um, Ariana, Peter, would you ever want to become a judge? No, we've talked about this a couple times on the channel. Um, no, I like the action too much. I like the negotiation. I like the, um, trial work. I like the arguments. I like representing people and the clients. Um, I like being their mouthpiece and fighting for them. I like figuring out and solving problems, um, and using leverage and things like that. I just, I like all of that too much, moving the chess pieces around to become a judge. I'll never say never, but I really don't think so. I, and I may have said never in another video, so I don't know why I said never say never. Uh, thank you, Andrea. This was interesting, right? This was a really interesting interview. Um, and I know that a lot of people sent me other interviews. So if there's one specific one that you love, if you want to send it to me, a lot of them had a lot of similarity, so I didn't want to do a bunch of them at the same time, but we'll see. A lot of people showed up for it. Hit that like button if you guys um, if you guys do like this video and want more um, reactions to these interviews, let me know. Kuvira, Earth, uh, nobody wants to hear that. I, I have, I'm, I'm decent at some things. Singing is not one of them. Art, anything artistic is really not one of them. Ashley Harris, uh, what about your dad? Would he become a judge? Absolutely not. If you think I like the action, he likes it even more than I do. I mean, nobody likes to go and fight in court more than my dad. Like when they say bulldog lawyers, he's the definition of it. I've tried to tame it down from learning from him because he's such a bulldog in trial. Um, would your film, would your firm help write a waiver of liability for my horse riding business? We really don't do a lot of that. Um, uh, there are firms in different areas that specialize in writing things like that. So reach out to us, lawyer, you know, at gmail.com. Um, I, I do talk to and help a lot of people from YouTube, specifically in injury cases, uh, wrongful death cases, catastrophic injury, car accidents. If you slipped and fell or tripped and fell because somebody else did something negligent, we have people call and say, Hey, I slipped and fell and hurt myself. But if there's no negligence on the part of the store or apartment complex or wherever it is that you fell, there's nothing we can do. And I try to explain that sometimes people get upset, but it is what it is. And there has to be actual negligence and wrongdoing on the part of somebody else for us to be able to take a case. 
but feel free, please reach out to us. We want to be a resource. It's one of the reasons why we started the channel to be a resource for as many people as possible. And that is what we specialize in are those injury cases. Uh, Tyler Hughes, she turned her papers in for running formal announcement will be tomorrow, Tyler. And I don't think any of us are surprised based on these interviews. So that's cool. We'll all be pulling for, if you're from Wisconsin, let us know how it goes. Um, I'm sure the media outlets will be covering it. And yes, something else fun. Uh, Carol, the short reels that we've been doing, the be a lawyer reels and other stuff like that. L keep letting me know if you guys like them and you can support them by going and hitting that like button. So uh, we know to keep putting the time and energy into making them. Uh, Chris and Rose, Papa Tia Bulldog. Oh snap. I got to see him in action now. Uh, generous. Your dad has such a great sense of humor. I love seeing him in the shorts. You're a lucky dude to have such a great team to work with every day. I 100% agree. They're so fun. Getting them on the camera is the harder part because they're even more fun. Generally speaking that you guys always don't get to see, but it is very, very cool. Uh, Sydney Alberts. I would love to gift more memberships in the future. You can find me on LinkedIn. If you would like one, um, I will help as many as I can. So everybody check out Sydney Alberts on LinkedIn. She's gifting memberships to the channel. Speaking of that, we are going to do a members only top 10 Christmas movies coming up in December. That's always fun when we do that. Just a little boost for the members. Um, the subs will be able to watch it and stuff too. So it's not excluding anybody. It's just a little boost for the people that do support the channel as members. Um, Christy Jenner just found the Be A Lawyer Reels and Azam is always supporting the Be A Lawyer Reels. So thank you. And some people are taking them very seriously. They're just to have a little fun to get some lighthearted content on the channel as well. Um, that short reel about words, you don't know hilarious. Yeah. I mean, I, I gotta say I took some inspiration from Daryl Brooks there. Um, and, and, you know, using lawful law and, uh, sustain and things like that. All right. That's all we got today. Um, I heard some people saying there are some other videos going on You're split. It's fine. Go watch all the videos. Tell your friends to come be part of the rewatch crew to tell me what they thought of this interview. Um, if they have any more questions, if they want to see, future interviews um, with Judge Doro, or I should say more interviews, then just let me know in the comments and let me know on uh, Instagram and Twitter. You guys know how to get a hold of me. Um, it's easy. We're very available um, to everybody that has questions and we want to help as much as possible. That's all we got for today. So thanks so much for being with us. Until next time, you guys are literally the best.